You're watching UPNI News, winner of the Edward R. Morrow Award for Overall Excellence. Tonight, nature's fury, nature's rage, thunder, lightning, and damaging winds. A spring storm packs one heck of a punch. Good evening, everyone. Lightning lit up the sky, thunder boomed, and rain gave lots of people quite a soaking. It's been quite a night. The severe weather roared through our area and left thousands of people in the dark. We have team coverage for you for a storm field with the very latest for us. Storm. Well, Ernie, as we take a look at the latest radar, what you're seeing is there's still a line of rather severe weather. Thunder showers occurring as you move through north central New Jersey, down underneath the city, and then just off the south shore of Long Island. Earlier today, this entire line was moving slowly across the tri-state area with some damaging results. Larry Cosgrove is outside in the wilds right now. And uh, Larry, how's it going? Stormer at a house in Mohegan Drive in Port Lee right now. I want to show you on camera that there's a tree that got knocked down by lightning. You can tell it's lightning because the leaves and the limbs are still intact. But were wind, the leaves and the uh, limbs would be sheared off the tree. So this bigger storm pushed through around 7 o'clock, the owner told me. This is all part of a large squall line, of course, pushed into the tri-state area. A spring storm ripped through the tri-state area, bringing heavy rain and severe lightning and thunder. The torrential rain first appeared in Kingston and Nyack, creating a slew of ponding and flooding reports on roads and causing power disruptions as well. A lot of rain fell in a short amount of time, causing floods in local streets. Winds gusting up to 75 miles per hour knocked down trees and electrical lines, resulting in major power outages around the New York area. For those unlucky enough to be on the major highways, the evening commute was a slow-going, wet affair. Pea-sized hail and numerous cloud-to-ground lightning bolts were common along the New Jersey Turnpike. The storms persisted for three to four hours around the New York metropolitan area. And one thing we have to tell you about, 16,000 homes still without power in Dumont, Ridgewood, and Teaneck so far. So storm raining right now, but the lightning has slackened off. All right, thanks very much, Larry. We do have that rain continuing on and off around the region. It's not going to be nearly as severe tomorrow as it was today, but there will be some rain and drizzle around. The skies will stay mostly overcast, and it is going to be much cooler. Temperatures around right now, 66 degrees, dropping from a high today of 83, and that happened in a very short time, one of the reasons why we had those thunder showers coming on through. Temperatures, again, as we look around the area, it's pretty interesting to note that right in here is where that front line has sagged down, but notice as the heat has stayed up here, the thunder showers have also stayed in around here and also just offshore as the temperatures have stayed warmer there. So we're looking at right now, the watch boxes up or across the region, still some very nasty weather around and it is moving from west to east. So there's a good chance that we'll be seeing some more heavier shower activity as we go along. This frontal line just sags a little bit south of us by tomorrow. So in the morning, there's a chance of some showers as a low moves along that front. And what we'll be looking at is severe weather to the south of the front and on and off showers throughout the day to the north. Come back and tell you more about what you can look forward to as we head into this weekend a little bit later. Ernie? Okay, thank you, Storm. There is a new attack tonight on violent video games. A new study claims that they're creating a culture of violence and they're hurting our children. And tonight, a lot of people are demanding action. Logan Crawford reports. You will die a slow, slow death. If these scenes were in a movie, the film would likely be rated R. Under 17, not permitted without a parent or guardian. But since the images are part of a game, anybody, no matter how young, can play. These games have become killing machines that teach children how to kill. State Senator Michael Balboni today released the findings of a year-long study. The bottom line, he says, violent video games desensitize children to pain, suffering, and death. The object of this game is to shoot an electrode into the heart of your opponent and fry them to death from the inside out. Like movies, the senator says, video games should be rated. Even though the state senator is calling for a rating system, there is already one in place. This game, House of the Dead 2, for example, warns parents that it contains lifelike violence. But parent-teacher groups say the current guidelines are confusing and rarely enforced, so a new law is being proposed, one that would require arcade owners to monitor violent games. Children under the age of 16 couldn't play violent video games without an adult supervising and break the law and arcade owners would face the same kind of penalties store owners are subject to when they sell alcohol and tobacco to minors. I think that the parents should accompany the kids to, you know, video arcades so that they are not exposed to these violent games. 
Titus Stewart of Queens, a parent of two, likes the idea of a new law. Kids usually try to imitate or um, act out what they see on video games or on TV, television shows or things of that nature. Now, the state senator says video games where you stand up and shoot a pistol or a machine gun at the screen are actually teaching young people the skills needed to carry out acts of mass murder. Brenda? Logan, thank you. Tonight, the verdict is guilty for Sante and Kenneth Kimes. The mother and son were convicted of killing millionaire Irene Silverman, even though her body was never found. Judia Chavez has details. Jurors rendered a guilty verdict for Sante and Kenneth Kimes after four days of deliberating. The mother and son who were accused of murdering Manhattan millionaire Irene Silverman were found guilty on 118 counts. The 82-year-old had vanished without a trace nearly two years ago. To this day, her body has never been found. There wasn't really any physical evidence of any kind which linked them to the unfortunate disappearance of Irene Silverman. Without a body, DNA, and blood evidence, jurors still convicted the 65-year-old and her 25-year-old son because of circumstantial evidence. Evidence that included plastic bags containing Silverman's personal documents, taped conversations, and keys to Silverman's Upper East Side apartment. Prosecutors contend the Kimes has also possessed another important piece of evidence, a forged deed. The two apparently had plans to take over Silverman's $4 million mansion. The linchpin of the prosecution's case were private diaries that were seized from both Sante and Kenneth Kimes. The defendant's attorneys say the 14 notebooks the contained self-incriminating information which helped jurors decide the Kimes' fate. But there was a lot of, um, a lot of plotting and planning that was in those notebooks. They conspired and, you know, they did a whole lot of things and I don't think anybody deserves to have that done to them. The two did not testify in the trial, which lasted three and a half months. Manhattan DA Robert Morgenthau issued this statement. The verdict of guilty in this case is extremely important. It sends a clear message that you cannot escape a murder conviction by disposing of the body. Sante and Kenneth Kimes could get life in prison. They're scheduled to be sentenced on June 27. 30, back to you. Thank you, Judy. Also in the news tonight, a mother suspected in the death of her own five-year-old daughter. Police say that the child starved to death and weighed only 17 pounds. Kathleen Trick has the heartbreaking details. The unthinkable tragedy happened here inside the sixth floor Bronx apartment. Five-year-old Sonia Karzan shared with her mother and three siblings. Police say the little girl who suffered from cerebral palsy was found dehydrated and malnourished and appeared to have died from starvation and neglect. I can never imagine that conscience would kill me softly. And as a mom, again, that's just not cool. Today, neighbors were disturbed by the news, especially Suni Sanchez, who is raising a seven-year-old son with cerebral palsy herself. Uh, I'm very sorry about that case, you know, because I have several palsy kids, too, and I can understand how that lady can do something like that. When the five-year-old girl was found, she weighed only 17 pounds. A source close to the investigation says she apparently had a history of low birth weight, but just this past December, the mother was investigated and no neglect was found. Today, the 24-year-old mother, Ebony Carzan, was not at home despite being released by police. But neighbors had a lot to say about the system they feel failed her daughter. Whether it be the welfare system, whether it be the community center, whether it be an older person, some outreach where you can go and tell someone that you're not feeling okay that day because you have a child that you can't even handle or don't know how. Now, the mother was originally arrested and charged with her daughter's murder, but late today, new information convinced prosecutors to drop the charges, at least for now. They say they'll wait to review the autopsy report before deciding whether to charge the mother with murder. Brenda? Kathleen, thank you. Rudy's next.